I want to talk to you about the Jesus way to your destiny, the Jesus way to your destiny. You know, the devil's way to your destiny. We read about that. I don't know if it was on Sunday or Wednesday. I think it might have been on Wednesday night. But we read about how remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the third temptation in the wilderness, the devil said to him, if you bow down, you, he said, you see all these kingdoms and all their glory. He said they've been given to me. And of course, they were given to the devil by Adam and Eve. They gave they surrendered their authority over the world to Adam and Eve or Adam and Eve surrendered it to the devil. And the devil said to Jesus, you see all these kingdoms and all their glory. I will give them to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, it was always God's will for Jesus to have the kingdoms and to have all the glory. But that wasn't God's way. That wasn't God's way. That was the devil's way compromise and bow down to the devil and you can have all these kingdoms. God wants Jesus to have all the kingdoms, but not by bowing down to the devil. Amen. Amen. So that was the devil's way to Jesus destiny, but it would have destroyed him and destroyed us. Then there's man's way. Man's way to their destiny is to, you know, uh, to, to, to compromise to lie sometimes, to cheat, to steal sometimes, to to step over other people because it's all about, you know, my three favorite people, me, myself and I. And that's man's way to their destiny. That's man's way to their dreams. That's man's way to their purpose. But then there's the Jesus way. Jesus fulfilled his destiny. Would you agree with me? He fulfilled God's purpose for his life. Would you agree with me? And Jesus had this one characteristic about himself that transcended all others. Now, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible in first John four seventeen where it says, as he is, so are we in this world, right? As he is, so are we in this world. And what is he? He's love. So we are. So we have love. He's victorious. So we're victorious. He's more than a conqueror. So we're more than conquerors. He's the head and not the tail. So we're the head and not the tail. He's above only and not beneath. So we're above only and not beneath. He's a son of he's the son of God. So we're sons and daughters of God. Are you with me still as he is? So are we. I've thought about this verse for years as he is. So are we. It's given me confidence. It's given me assurance. It's given me peace of mind as he is. So are we as he is. So are we. He's risen. We're risen. He's victorious. We're victorious. He's healed. We're healed. We are what he is. But then I thought there's one thing and God has been speaking to me about it. My heart's been speaking to me about it. But there's one other thing that sometimes we we neglect and we overlook in identifying with Jesus about. He's all those things and none of them are wrong. Every one of them are true. He is all of those things. But he's also something else. That I need to claim as he is. So are we. And you know what it is? He's humble. He's humble. You know, there's nothing. There's no pride in Jesus, no arrogance, never inflated with self, never self serving, never after his own thing. In fact, there were times where he didn't. We know at least one time he didn't want to do the will of God. Remember the time in the Garden of Gethsemane when he when he said he said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass but not my will, thy will be done. This is humility. This is being humble. This is the one attribute and the one characteristic that we need to start identifying with the same way we identify with we're more than conquerors, the same way we identify with we're the head and not the the tail, the same way we we identify with uh, we're blessed coming in and blessed going out. We also need to identify with we're humble. 
because the world is going to come to Jesus when the world sees some humble people, some humble Christians. Humility is not inferiority. Humility is not feeling low or bad about ourselves. Humility is not thinking that we can be have to be intimidated or inferior to anything else in this world. But humility is to believe what God says about us. And it's, humility is to exalt God's word above my word and to exalt God's thoughts above my thoughts and to exalt God's ways above my ways. Pride is to exalt my thoughts above God's thoughts, to exalt my opinions above God's opinions, to exalt my way above God's way. And I wonder how many Christians they'll, they're, they're saved, they're born again, but they're still not walking in true humility or not even trying to because they don't understand what humility is. And I see this all the time in Christians. The, the number one characteristic that you can have, the sweetest, most beautiful characteristic of Jesus was his humility. Did he ever look down on anybody? Yes. When he was bending over to help them up. Did he ever uh, did did he ever uh, cr criticize somebody or judge or condemn somebody? No, never, except religious people that trusted in themselves, because that's the exact opposite of humility. Humility is trusting in God, not self trusting in. It's depending on God, not self. It's God reliance, not self reliance. It's relying on God, trusting God. That's what humility is. You see, we think humility is a is some sort of uh, feeble mentality and a feeble disposition and a, a very shy, feeble, weak position. But that's not what humility is. Jesus said he said in Matthew chapter 11, he said, um, I want you to come to me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for I am meek and humble of heart and you'll find rest for your souls. You know, the most godlike characteristic is humility, the most godly characteristic that you could ever want and that you could ever emulate is humility. And because Jesus had every right to stay in heaven, but he humbled himself and came to earth, had every right to to to, to shroud himself in all of his glory but he made himself into human flesh and became a man. He had every right to call down fire whenever somebody crossed him or wronged him on earth, but he never called down fire. He always called down healing, deliverance, freedom, mercy, forgiveness, grace. Oh, beloved, God gives grace to the humble. Look at what he says in James, chapter four, verse six, James, chapter four, verse six. And he gives more grace. James four, verse six, for he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, I believe God loves me unconditionally and I believe God is for me, not against me. But I believe I sub I do. I can subject myself to the resistance of God. When I'm in pride, God resists the proud, whether they're saved or not, he resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Now, listen, God does not give grace to the perfect. He does not give grace to the holy. He does not give grace to the self-righteous. He gives grace to the who? The humble, the humble. He resists the proud. Notice it doesn't say he resists the guy that blew it. He resists the guy that cheated. He resists the guy that stole or even he resists the guy I, I know this is sound controversial, but he doesn't say he resists the homosexual. It doesn't say he resists the adulterer. It says he resists the proud. I'm not encouraging you to sin. I'm not encouraging you to choose lifestyles that are contrary to God's word. But if a person is dealing with homosexuality, or if a person is dealing with an addiction or a habit in their life or any other sin, if they're humble about it, God gives grace. And if a person is living all the morally true uh, standards that a Christian should live, 
but they're in pride. God resists them. He doesn't resist them because they're morally impure and he doesn't give them grace because they're morally pure. He gives grace to the humble when it really boils down to it all. Beloved, we have two choices to make in life that determines the outcome of everything, the path of humility or the path of pride. Oh, it's it's like a quiet church today. So. Welcome to Life Changers Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Nothing against the Presbyterians. I love Presbyterians. I don't know many, but I love them. You know, St. Augustine said something very powerful. He said it was years ago. He said it was it was pride that changed angels into devils. And it is humility that makes men as angels. It was pride that changed angels into devils. And it is humility that makes men as angels. You know, I think we've all met somebody at one time or another in our life in a time of need, in a midnight hour, in a bad situation, and somebody really out of nowhere treated us with such kindness and and helpfulness and 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 what and, and what do what do we say about them? We never met them before and we and, and, and yet they treated us so kindly and they treated us so gracefully when we needed it the most. And what do we usually say about that person? Oh, was that wasn't that person an angel? Wasn't that person an angel? Have you ever said that about somebody? Man, that person was an angel to me. That person was like an angel. Now, maybe they were an angel because the Bible does say that angels are real and angels appear sometimes and angels show up without you realizing that they're angels. But what God also wants us to know is that he wants us as men and women to treat people and to act like angels towards others where we're coming through for people, where we're interested in helping people, where we're ministering to others, where we where we care about the needs of others, where we're where we're, our mind is not on ourselves, but it's on Jesus and it's on others. And when we have our minds on Jesus and others and then yourself, J O Y, that brings joy. Jesus, others and you in that order is really the best way to live. It's the humble way to live. It's the path of humility. It's it's how Jesus lived. He did. I mean, oh, I want to get to this in a minute, but I want to I, I, I need to go through a couple things to really get have you get a hold of this. You know, uh, George Washington Carver discovered like a thousand ways of using a peanut, a great scientist, a great discoverer. And he developed actually hundreds of ways uh, to, of, uh, of useful products for the peanut. And he said this, he was quoted as saying this. When I was young, I said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. But God answered that knowledge is reserved for me alone, son. So I said, God, tell me the mystery of a peanut. Then God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. And he told me. That's how he that's those are his words. That's how he experienced God. Man, I don't know about you, but I've I've returned to my first love, peanut butter. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, that's all we could eat. You know, that's all we had. We take peanut butter. You know, and when I got you know older, I was like, I'm not eating peanut butter. That's that's you know, I don't want to feel broke anymore. Uh, you know. <laughs> now, one of my go to meals is peanut butter. I love peanut butter. I, 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 I treat peanut butter. I look at peanut butter like 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 caviar. I, I think it's a delicacy. I think there's so many great peanut butters in the world today. You can put it on toast. You can put it on bananas. You can put it on a spoon and eat it. as long as you got some milk. Now, don't forget, milk is the blessing of the Lord. He, he takes us to the land of milk and honey, baby, milk and honey. Can you, you try to eat peanut butter without milk? <laughs> But I'll tell you what, that dude discovered hundreds of uses of a peanut because he was humble. I think um, Andrew Murray said it best when he gave us a definition of humility. He said it is to expect nothing from others, to wonder at nothing that is done to me 
and to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me. And to be at rest when I'm blamed or despised, it's to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel. That was his definition of humility, which I think is pretty, pretty powerful is to expect nothing from others, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me and when I feel blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel. You know, it's funny about humility. It's you can see humility in the way that God designed our human bodies. Boy, when you look at your body, you should be humble. (laughs) Nothing to be real proud of. But but that's not why I'm saying that. The, The reason that I'm saying is the body really the human body does reflect Um, us being humble because God wisely think about this. God wisely designed the human body so that we can neither pat our own backs nor kick ourselves too easily. And that's really humility is we don't we don't pat our own backs and we don't kick ourselves. That's really a picture of humility in the way God created the human body. You know, I think uh, we talked about going deep last week and it reminded me of another quote by St. Augustine who said, do you wish to rise? Begin by descending. You plan a tower that will pierce the clouds. Lay first the foundation of humility. He said, you plan a tower that will pierce the clouds. Lay first the foundation of humility. What a powerful, powerful thought. You know, um, in this scripture in James four, verse six, where he says he gives grace to the humble, the word humble there is literally translated as God reliant rather than self reliant, which ironically always exalts a person and brings them true worth. God reliant rather than self reliant, which uh, which ironically always exalts a person when it says he gives grace to the humble. It literally means he promotes them, he honors them, he exalts them and he blesses them. He promotes them and honors them, exalts them and blesses them. In first Peter, chapter five, he says basically the same thing in first Peter, chapter five, verse six. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You know, we live in a world where people are trying to exalt themselves, promote themselves, seek the praise of people. And God says, I will exalt you in due time when you humble yourself. There's no trick around this. There's no shortcut. There's no. Okay, I'm going to. Okay, I really want to be exalted. So I'm going to go ahead and humble myself. Good. It's like, well, can a can a person cheat the system by humbling themselves in order to be exalted? No. This is foolproof. It's cheat proof. You can't cheat this system because if you truly humble yourself, God is the one that will exalt you. But it will be in due time. Not you time. You trying to see exaltation in you time or due time. If you try to see it in due time, if you'll just humble yourself, God will do the one. God will be the one exalting you in due time. Listen. When we boast and brag, one of the things that I that I really hate about preachers and I love a lot of preachers and a lot of preachers are my friends and some of the best preachers are my friends and some of my best friends. But when I hear preachers bragging and boasting and talking about how much they're they they're doing for God and how great their church is and how great. Now, I don't mind if we talk about what the church has done. So that you are encouraged and, you know, but I'm never going to tell you what I've done. That's for Jesus to tell. That's for Jesus to honor. That's for Jesus to recognize. I'm not looking for man's recognition. I want Jesus recognition. I want Jesus praise. I want Jesus way. I want to do things Jesus way. How about you? And, and, and it just. You know, it, it says in, in Proverbs 18, verse 12, and I don't know if they can find this version, but I found this version in the um, Berean Bible in Proverbs 18, verse 12. It says before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. Do you know that it is God's will to honor his people? 
He said, those who honor me, I will honor. Do you know that you don't have to fight for people to honor you and people to like you and people to give you attention? Do you know that if you'll just humble yourself and learn what humility is, it's the greatest attribute of Jesus life. It's the greatest. It's the most godlike characteristic of all that God would become man and take on man's sin and become sin for us. That's humility. But before his downfall, a man's heart is proud. My encouragement to every human being, my, to myself, to you, to business people, to successful people, to the pretty people, to the rich people, to the preachers. My recommendation and encouragement to all is humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. But God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You know, he doesn't. God doesn't accept excuses. You know, if you say, well, I sinned because of my parents and I sinned because of this and I I blew that blew that because of this. And God doesn't accept excuses, but he gives plenty of grace. Humility is the currency of grace. Humility. Humility is the currency of grace. It's the currency of heaven. When the angels wanted to exalt themselves, they were banished from heaven. There is no pride in heaven. Zero. There is only humility. God is only on the throne because the because he is he is, he was and he is to come. He is uh, it would be it, it would it would it, he he's 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 on the throne and he's to be praised because our lives will never be complete until we praise what is most beautiful, what is most lovely and what is most deserving. And he is most beautiful. He is most loving. He is most deserving. And only when we praise him, because that's who he is, that's when we are truly fulfilled in life. The reason why God wants to be praised is because that's the only time you'll ever be happy. You will never be happy until you're praising the very one that is worthy of all the praise. And when you're and when you're praising and when you're praising anything that is less than worthy, you'll be sad, disappointed and discouraged the rest of your life. And listen, look at and and look at what Jesus said. I want you to see something in John, chapter five, verse forty four about about self praise and human praise in 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 John, chapter five, verse forty four in the Amplified Bible. If you guys can put this in the Amplified version. It's it says something really powerful. John, chapter five, verse forty four in the Amplified, he says, how is it possible for you to believe? Jesus said, how can you ever learn to believe when you are content to receive praise and honor and glory from one another and do not seek the praise and honor and glory which comes from him alone, who is God? Boy, when you talk about yourself, it's because you're trying to receive praise and honor and glory from one another. When you boast, brag. When you try to make yourself feel better by making somebody else feel smaller. You're trying to receive you're content to seek praise and glory and honor from men, from people, from one another. Rather than seeking the praise and honor and glory which comes from him who alone is God. I just want one of these. You know, there's all these online, right? On Facebook and all the social media stuff. I don't mean to be picking on it, but it needs to be picked on sometimes. But there's all these likes, right? All these thumbs up, right? A thumbs up going here and a thumbs up going there. And, and people get excited when they see all these thumbs going up. I want one thumb up and I want it to be the father's thumb. I want the father to give me the thumbs up. I want my heavenly father. I just want one like I just want one like from God. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. And it doesn't matter what anybody else feels, because that's humility to want only the praise that comes from him and to give only praise that goes to him. 
And there's nothing wrong with praising people, you know, in a, in a sense of affirming them. Hey, you did a great job. Hey, wow, that was awesome. Hey, I'm really proud of you. There's nothing wrong with doing those things. What's wrong is seeking those things, seeking the approval of people, the likes of people. The praise, the accolades, the affirmation of people rather than the praise and accolades and affirmation of our heavenly father who will one day say to us, hopefully, well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. You see, you enter into the joy. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You enter into the joy of your master when you're seeking only the approval of the master. You enter into the joy of the Lord when you're seeking only the approval of the Lord. Does that make sense? Now, you don't have to seek the approval of the Lord at the detriment of other people because you don't have to try to prove, well, I don't need you. I don't care what you think. I don't. In fact, you know, and you give you start throwing salutes up with fingers. I don't care what you think. It's that's not the same as not caring what people think. That's arrogant. That's 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 not self deprecating. It's not it's not valuing the other person as much as you value you. Oh, humility, this is the key. This is the this is the Jesus way to your destiny, the Jesus way to your God given purpose. You know, I told you a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, I said we're supposed to be clothed with three things. We're to be clothed with with righteousness. God clothes us with righteousness. We're to be clothed with power. He will clothe you with power from on high. And then we're to be clothed with humility. But that's something we do. Only God can clothe you with righteousness. Only God clothes you from on high. But only you can clothe yourself with humility. You don't want God to humble you. You want to humble yourself. You don't want life to humble you. You want to humble yourself. Because when you humble yourself, God will exalt you. When you humble yourself, life will exalt you. You know, um, the, the, the I forget the Jim Collins, the guy that wrote from good to great. Uh, and he did a study of companies that were really good versus companies that were really great. And he compared them and he said one of the things that marked the greatest companies when they went from good to great was when their leaders were humble. When their leaders were humble and I don't, I'm not up here to claim that that I am, because that's the one thing that you need to ask for continually from God, but never claim you have it. You know, when you ask for healing, you need to claim you got it. I got it. I'm healed by his stripe. I Lord, I ask you for healing and I receive it by your stripes. I'm healed in Jesus name. But you can't have that mentality with humility. You can't be like, Lord, I'm asking for humility and I receive. I got it in Jesus name. I'm humble. Well, I'm the humblest man on earth. I'm the humblest preacher. I'm the humblest person in the world. Boy, when people come in contact with me, they're going to see how humble I am. <laughs> you see, that's the one thing you can keep asking God for, but never claim you received it. Don't don't get me wrong. We want to receive it. You understand. But we can't claim. Don't claim you have it. Don't be like the guy that he was so humble. He's a servant and volunteer in the church. He was so humble. They, they decided to give him a little medal. That said humblest servant in the church, but then they saw him wearing it all the time, so they took it away. <laughs> the poem goes. It needs more skill than I can tell to play the second fiddle. Well, you see, the great conductor uh, Leonard Bernstein was once asked what instrument is the most difficult to play. He thought for a moment and then he replied the second fiddle. He said, I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. Humility, the word humility. It comes from the word humus, H-U-M-U-S. It is a Latin word, humus. Listen to what it means. It actually is the same word for earth. Humility is the word earth. 
What does that mean? It means people of humility are down to earth people. They are soft hearted people because the word for earth is soil. In other words, it's easy to plant good seeds in a humble person's heart. They are pliable and receptive to the seed of God's word. They're receptive to correction. They are listeners. They are not talkers first. They are listeners first. They are from the earth. They become the patch of earth that others walk on to find the path of life. Listen to what I'm saying. They become the patch of earth. Humble people are willing to be the patch of earth that other people walk on to find the path of life. You know, we have a saying, don't go, don't get walked on. And it's true. We don't want to be taken advantage of. And if somebody keeps taking advantage of you, you need to have boundaries. But we but it's an attitude of I am a patch of earth. That's what I am. And I am willing to be the path that somebody walks over to find life. You know, you you don't have to go any further to see what humility is than to look at the life of Jesus and look at what it says in Philippians chapter two, verse five. Look at what he says. Philippians chapter two, verse five. Let this mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So now he's talking about a mind or a mindset or an attitude. One translation says an attitude. It's an attitude of humility. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although being in the form of God, verse six says, although being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God. And guess what? We're seated with Christ in heavenly places, so we're equal with Christ. But Jesus, he didn't think it was he was robbing God by claiming he was equal to him. He knew he was equal to him, but but he didn't use that to avoid humbling himself. He could have said, I'm equal to God. I'm not humbling myself. And we could say, I'm equal to Christ. I'm not humbling myself. I'm equal to Christ. I'm not going to let that person get the best of me. I'm I'm equal to Christ. I'm not going to let that person do this to me. I'm not going to let that person say this about me. I'm not going to let this person think that about me. I'm not going to let them spread rumors about me. And you know what? Let them spread all the rumors they want, because truth crushed to earth will rise again. If somebody tells you if somebody's saying something about you that's not true, the truth will rise. And if what they're saying is true, you might as well shut your mouth. Because you either got to lie to pretend it's not really true. Or you got to always defend yourself. But Jesus was of no reputation. Verse seven, look at what it says. But he was of no reputation. When you have a good reputation, you're always trying to keep it up. When you have a bad reputation, you're always trying to clean it up. So you, when you are of no reputation, meaning he wasn't living for the reputation of people. I got to make sure that I have a good reputation in the eyes of people. No, I need to have this mind of humility. And then whatever anybody wants to think about me is between them and God. If we're just humble, you know, they wrote a, somebody wrote a letter to George Whitfield, the great, great revival preacher 200 and something years ago. And um, and they wrote all these criticisms against against you're this and you're that and you're this and and you don't do this well and you don't do that well. And you're trying to do this to God's people. You're trying to do this and you have the wrong heart and you have a wrong motive and you're preaching wrong. And his response in his letter back to the person was, dear sir, thank you for your letter. But I want you to know I know far worse about me than anything you wrote about me. (laughs) It's humility. It's humility. So look at what Jesus does. Being made of no reputation, he takes the form of a bondservant and comes in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, verse eight, he humbles himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Notice. The ladder, you know, we talk about climbing up the ladder. Jesus is climbing down the ladder. He's in heaven. He comes to earth. He's on earth. He becomes a man. He's a man. He becomes a bondservant. He's a bondservant. He becomes obedient. He becomes obedient to the point of death. He becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The God of the universe cannot go any lower. 
And why would we try to ascend when Jesus descended? And even John the Baptist understood the Jesus way when he said he must increase and I must decrease. You know, when it's all about me, the church is not going to be very good. But when it's about Jesus, it's going to be real good. When your life is all about you, it's not going to be very good. But when it's all about Jesus, it's going to be really, really good. Remember, he exalts the humble. He gives grace to the humble, not the holy, the humble. We really need to not get that mistaken. I'm not saying to be unholy. What I'm saying is God doesn't exalt your holiness. He exalts your humility. He exalts you when you're humble and God doesn't resist the guy that made a mistake. God doesn't resist the guy who sinned. God doesn't resist the guy who's struggling, the guy who doesn't understand. He's the guy who's not sure of his identity, the guy who's not sure about the guy who falls into lust, falls into some sin. He God does not resist that guy. He resists the proud. If you fall into sin, humble yourself and receive his mercy and ask for his mercy and his help in your time of need. And he will give it to you because God resists the proud, not the guy that blew it. God exalts the humble, not the guy that never blew it. I'm not encouraging you to blow it. Please don't hear me. The sooner you the sooner you stay humble, the less your fall is going to hurt. The lower you are to the ground, the less impact it has when you make a mistake. God help us. This is the Jesus way to your destiny, the Jesus way. Listen, to humble yourself means to be dependent upon God, to submit to God. That's his way of thinking. Um, it's it's faith is exalting God's words above yours. Pride is exalting your word above God's faith is exalting God's thoughts and opinions above yours. That's what humility is. Pride is exalting your opinions and thoughts above God's. It's to be God dependent. It's to be God dependent. That's what humility is. It's to be God dependent to, to humility is to be a listener. If you want to walk in humility, be God dependent. Look to God. Look for his like. Look for his likes, not other people's likes. Look for his approval, not other people's approval. Um, humility is to accept man's mistreatment with an eye towards God's good treatment. That humility says I can accept man's mistreatment because my eye is on God's good treatment. Somehow God will turn this around if I stop being defined by what people have done to me and stop acting like the victim. If you got an issue with me, I will do with the best of my ability, work it out with you. And that's how we need to be with each other, because there is no problem that humility can't solve. None. There is no problem that humility can't solve. There is no conflict that re that humility cannot resolve. There is no heart that humility can't soften. I pray you get a hold of this, you know, if one of the ways to really humble ourselves is to listen. They say I read an article recently that that listening, like if you ever want to help somebody heal from something, start with just listening to them because their healing begins when they feel heard. When they feel heard, you know, David said that in Psalm 116, verse one, he said, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. He heard my voice. He heard my supplication. He heard my petition. He heard me when I cried. He listened. God's the best listener. And he's the one who should be doing all the talking. And yet he's the best listener. I love the Lord. He doesn't say I love the Lord because he spoke to me the other day. He said, I love the Lord because he heard me. 
Boy, it affects your emotions and it affects your relationship with God when you realize he listens. He's so humble. He's so humble. He's the humblest. He's he is humility. You want to walk in humility, take interest in other people. Stop being as interested in talking about yourself and be interested in other people. Take interest in other people, draw people out. And then don't blame others for your mistakes or for your sins. This is humility. Well, we're not blaming others for our mistakes or our sins, but we take them to God. We take our mistakes and sins to God. He's already cleansed us. He understands he's, he's the throne of grace is open 24 hours a day where you can receive mercy and grace in your time of need. And how about this one? This is humility. Learn to ask for forgiveness. Stop saying you're sorry. Because that's just a declaration. And that's running over somebody. I'm sorry. What we usually say, we're sorry just to end the conversation. I'm fine. I'm sorry. Can we just stop now? I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> oh, some of you heard that. <laughs> but to say, w- would you forgive me as a question? Which leaves a silent opening there. Would you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Will you? It's one thing to say, would you just forgive me (laughs) versus will you forgive me? Could you forgive me? It's asking. That's humility. It's asking. It's not. Demanding. Boy, you get a hold of this. It's an attitude. Let this mind be in you. It does not inferiority. It's not feebleness. That's not humility. The humble spirit does not demand their own way, has the attitude of a servant, does not seek attention or credit, forgives when offended, does not criticize others, not looking for the negative, but is teachable and thankful and remembering. A humble person remembers what God has done, is thankful for what God has done. And I believe a humble person gets rid of their conditions with God. Like I'll forgive that person if they do this. I'll start tithing if I get a better job. Um, I'll serve you, Lord, if you help me. I'll volunteer in the church if they give me money when I need it. One lady came like 20, you know, hadn't seen her in like 15 or 20 years. And she said, I want my tithe back. From, I'm like, from when? She's like, you know, from 15 years ago. I'm like, That's been spent. I mean, we, we you know where your tithe is? It's in Haiti. You know where your tithe is? It's in the inner streets of Chicago, getting people delivered from drugs and getting kids saved and getting souls saved. You know where your tithe is? You know where your tithe is? It's in little children's backpacks that couldn't afford to get their own pencils for school. You know where your tithe is? It's in India. You know where your tithe is? It's feeding the poor. It's feeding the hungry. It's raising people from their beds of sicknesses. It's in the streets in the cold where our teams go out and give out hot chocolate. It's at the gas station. That's where your tithe is, where we give away gas to people when they don't have any money for fuel to get where they want to go, where they need to go. Let me tell you where your tithe is. It's in heaven where it's waiting for you, where moth and rust cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. My God, when we realize everything we do is for his glory, and for his honor, we'll stop expecting anything from people and we'll start expecting a glo- the glory that only comes from the one who alone is God. And we will give him all the glory and from him only we will ever receive any glory. If there's ever any glory to be given, it will come from him and him alone. We will not look to others to make us happy. We will not look to others to make it
get right with us. We will not look to others to depend upon them to treat us a certain way in order for us to feel like we can now reach our destiny. No, the Jesus way to your destiny is humility. It's humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of our almighty God. My God, he's worthy of all the glory. And he descended and he descended and he descended and he descended. And let me tell you something. What goes down in God's kingdom will always come up. What is planted will always produce a bountiful, abundant harvest. Come on, let's stand together.